Welcome to My Life, Chassidus Applied, episode 373. This program is dedicated in memory of Francesco Lepore and Harry and Agnes Montgomery. Well, we're coming straight out of this rich holiday season, the month of Tishrei, Rosh Hashanah, the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, the four days between Yom Kippur and Sukkot, and Sukkot leading into Hashanah Rabbah, Shemini Atzeres, and Simchas Teirah. And just yesterday was Shabbos Bereshis, the Shabbos that serves as an interface between the holiday season and the rest of the year. Chesidus, explains that the month of Tishrei, as its name indicates, Tishrei is the letters Reishis, like from the Pesach, Mereishis Hashanah Ad Achrishan, Reishis without an Aleph, is the letters Tishrei. Reishis is ahead. It's not just the beginning of the year, it's the head of the year. Like Rosh Hashanah is not just Tchilas Hashanah, it's not just the beginning of the year, it's the head of the year. What's the difference? The beginning is like the top of your body is the head. But the head is much more than just the top. It's the central nervous system, the control center, mission control of the entire body. So too in time, Rosh Hashanah, and more generally Tishrei, is the central nervous system of all the days of the year. And it controls them from the head. So these are therefore a month that is so powerful in that sense because it controls not just the month but everything that will happen the coming year. Exodus indeed explains that from the holidays each one has its own power and energy. We derive and draw energy into the everyday. So from Rosh Hashanah which is Yom Tevim Moyedim Kalolim it's called. General, all-encompassing holidays that are just not just what you experience that day, but they're also a source of energy. And Rosh Hashanah, renewal. Kabbalah Seil, the idea of experiencing a higher and being accountable to a higher reality. Yom Kippur, the sanctity, the hope, the forgiveness, that nothing is impossible. That even when the tablets were broken, and even when a relationship is betrayed, you can rebuild and do tshuva, return to that core essence. And finally, Sukkot, and each day growing, celebration, joy, simcha, all the way to its apex, the culmination of simcha state. That from Rosh Hashanah, we gain the energy of renewal and connection to a higher reality in every day of the year. From Yom Kippur, the sanctity, tshuva, forgiveness, every day of the year. And from Sukkot, and especially simcha state, simcha and joy throughout the year. So when you think of it that way, these are really resources, gifts given to us that can help us cope with and deal with any challenge that comes our way. And even if there isn't a challenge, to cope, to grow, and be the best possible human beings we can be. So that's where we are right now. And Bereshis is an interface. It's the last Shabbos of the month of Tishrei. But it's also Shabbos Mevarchim. It blesses the month of Cheshvan which is the first of the so-called mundane months going outside of Tishrei, outside of the head. And and indeed, Bereshis is the letters Reshis. It also has the words Reshis, head, like Rosh Hashanah, like Tishrei, Reshis. So it serves as an interface that allows us to bridge these two realities. But here comes the big question. How do you maintain the inspiration? How do we maintain the inspiration that we gain in a month like Tishrei. It's one thing to get inspired, it's another thing to maintain it. And we all see how difficult that may be. So let's address that. The first thing we need to state that nothing comes without effort. The Gemara says that uh, it became one of the Yud based Psukhme Mamari Chazal. If someone says, Yegaiti Valei Matsosi, I've made effort, I've toiled, and I've not found results. Do not accept that. Do not believe them. 
someone says, I have found results, but I've not toiled, lo yagaitu matsasi, you also don't accept or believe them. Yagaiti matsasi, timing. Which means you made effort, that generates results. And we're talking about not superficial or temporary results, we're talking about permanent results. So it all depends on the effort we make. And the Torah, in its infinite wisdom, gives us not just the energy of these holidays, the idea of renewal, of sanctity, forgiveness, tshuva, return, hope, joy, but also how to turn that into a daily experience. Because that's where the real, where it really plays itself out. That's the real objective and the real goal. So what, what does one do? So going back to those memoriam of Chassidus, so they say that exactly is what a rush is. That's what a rush is. A head doesn't just control the body one time, send signal one time, and that's it. Every second. Just look and study your own body, study your own being. And you'll see the head is constantly, the mind, the central nervous system, the control center, is constantly controlling the days. Well, not the days, the part of the body. So the same thing with Rosh Hashanah and Tishrei, it's controlling the entire year, even after you leave the month. But, we, but the difference is, in Tishrei, it's obvious, because the holidays gives, gives us that, those powers. And after Tishrei, we need to generate it, we need to access it. But it's there, the head is speaking to every part of the body, and the head of the year, the month of Tishrei, is speaking to every day of the year. But you need to do something about it. So what does it come to, to as the, as the Maimorim explained? That every day we have a microcosm of Rosh Hashanah. When, when is it? Right in the morning when you say, Moda'ani, lefanecha melechai v'kayim shechzata b'nishmasi, bechem l'rabba munasecha. What do you say? Moda'ani lefanecha, melech. What do we do on Rosh Hashanah? We crown the king. Tamlichuni alechem. And we are accepting a renewed contract with God who renews the, the annual contract of the, of, of, for the life of, and the sustenance of existence. And on a microcosmic level, every morning we do that. And it's directly connected. So Rosh Hashanah of Tishrei is actually implanted in each day, but we need to say it and we need to think about it, not just lip service. Yom Kippur is a mini Yom Kippur in every day. Not necessarily the fasting, but the ability that tshuva, to be able to correct mistakes, to grow, forgiveness, sanctity. Every day we have moments when we do that, whether it's a moment of prayer or it's a moment when we make that effort. And finally, joy. So though the full-blown joy is on Sukkot and all the way leading to Simcha Stereh, like the full-blown Yom Kippur is on Yom Kippur, it's Achaz Bashana, and the full-blown Rosh Hashanah is on Rosh Hashanah, but in a microcosm, it's there every day, but we have to do something. So how do we do it? So we're told. It says three pillars upon which the world rests, stands. Elam also includes the microcosmic world. That every human being is a universal microcosm. And what are the three pillars? I've spoken about this. The spiritual spa, study, prayer, action. Teda, Avedig, Mils, Chasadim. In psychological terms, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral conditioning. If your mind, every day, you feed it, and you meditate, you think about Moida'ani, about your neshama coming to you as a new neshama, a refreshed neshama, and you just don't pass over it, you focus on it, even for a minute. And you feel it in your heart. You have an emotional inspiration from that. And then you play it out in action by doing a good deed, a kind word. Finding a person every day, a new person to say something kindly to or to give charity to. In addition to all the habits and rituals that we have, do something new, that generates something new. It's cause and effect. But it's not creating it yesh from nowhere. It's all there because Tishrei is feeding it. The mind is feeding every part of the life, of every day of the year. So it's about continuing the Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, and Simchas Torah experience each day in its own small way. That's how it doesn't leave, because you're making it there. 
And that's why we say, The Torah has in a number of places, it says the word Hayyem, Hayyem, and other places. What's Hayyem? Today, when it was, the Torah was given, when the Torah was written, time of Moshe Rabbeinu, Hayyem say, says the Medrash, the Sifri, and the Rashi cites it, Every day, the Torah Mitzvah should be for you new, not like an old custom, an old thing that you're doing and just repeating, with new intention, with new vitality. And that's what creates dynamic energy. So there's no looking to anyone else that's going to inspire you. Tishrei inspires us with the power of its holidays. We're in the palace of the king, God, and he's imbuing us with all these resources. Chedr Shashvi, the seventh month, also from the word Muzba Bakayel, says the Medrash. It's sated, it's saturated with everything. In all ends of the spectrum, from the days of awe to the days of joy. From renewal of Rosh Hashanah to the sanctity and forgiveness and tshuva of Yom Kippur to the celebration of, of Sukkot. But then comes the next step. What are you going to do? What am I going to do? It's all there for you, but now we have to access that which the head of the year is transmitting to us. And that requires work. Yes, more work than in Tishrei, because Tishrei, we ride on the wings of these holidays. And now you have to, we have to initiate and access it. And that's the way, my friends, how we maintain inspiration. That it doesn't just last for a short period of time. Now, it takes effort till that becomes part of who we are, and then your day becomes exciting like Tishrei itself. So, so the questions that have come in about this topic, how do we maintain the inspiration? Can we bottle energy of Simchas, the energy of Simchas Teda? So an interesting letter I received, an email, and here's a good opportunity to um, encourage you to use this forum and platform that we created chassidahsupply.com, where you can submit any question. It's completely anonymous because we cannot trace. It's just you post your question. And we, one of the hallmarks and one of the trademarks of this program is no question is off, is off um, limits. So everything will be addressed. So please take advantage of this. Go to chassidahsupply.com and you can find a forum where you can submit any question. So here's a nice, interesting letter I received. That I'd like to read. And that is, Dear Rabbi Jacobson, last year on Simchas Teir I saw a man who I suspect to be a tzaddik nister. That's a hidden righteous person. He was dancing in 770 while reaching above his head, grabbing handfuls of air and putting it in his pockets. I asked him why he was doing that and he said he was collecting the positive energy of pure Simcha and storing it so it could last him the entire year. Does it say anywhere in Kabbalah that it is possible to do that? To store the physical air, humidity, and sweat of Simchas Teda, dancing so that it can be released later in the year when needed. On a more practical level, what can us regular people do to retain the amazing energies of the Tishrei holidays so they can last all year? Thank you for your great Sunday Torah class, and may the energy of Simchas Teda bring you and your viewers Pure joy throughout the entire year. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And obviously the air does change, even physically. It becomes filled with that joy. is palpable. And you see dancing in Simchas Teda, you experience it. Whether you can bottle the actual air, maybe. Maybe certain people can do that. We do have the concept of Avira, that it's Yisrael Machim, that the Avid itself can make one wiser. The Rebbe speaks about Mishnayis Balpeh, how it's Mezachich, refines the environment. But definitely spiritually, as we've been discussing. Tishrei, that's what Tishrei is about. It's about providing those resources. A saturated month, Muzba Bakoil, from the word Vesavata, not just that we get nourishment, but it's filled, sated. And then, in the expression of the Friedrich Rebbe, that from Fanander Pak in the Peklach. Like when someone travels, after you return home, now you unpack your luggage. You unpack the peklach. What peklach? The, that you gathered throughout the month of Tishrei. So that's the whole point of our discussion here, which is that it's definitely 
the purpose of it all and how we can access and actually unpack those bag, that, package, that, those, that baggage, that luggage, into our personal daily lives. Okay, so I believe we covered that point. But now, this leads us to the next month. So if Tishrei is so filled with holidays, and the word itself, Tishrei, tells us about the head, the central nervous system, the control center of the entire year, Shabbos Bereshis is the interface between Reshis of Tishrei into the month of Cheshvan. So it is the last Shabbos of Tishrei, but also the month that blesses, the Shabbos that blesses the entire month of Cheshvan. And we also know that Shabbos is Baruch and Kol Yemen. My name is Baruch and Kol Yemen. All the days of the week which include the month of Cheshvan are blessed from Shabbos. So what does Cheshvan indicate? What does it personify? And its name also is part of it. So let's begin with a question. The question is, why is there such a stark contrast? As one person writes, that Tishrei is filled with holidays. Literally, almost every day is a holiday. Rosh Hashanah, the Sarasimei Tshuva, Yom Kippur, the four days between Yom Kippur and Sukkot are Sukkim be mitzvahs. Jews are busy with mitzvahs. Sukkot, Shainer Rabbe, Shemir Yatzera, Simchas And it comes Cheshmer suddenly like a drop, the other extreme. No holidays at all. I remember when the Rebbe asked the question, he went through all the months of the year and indeed pointed out that only Cheshvan. Kislev has the end of Kislev Hanukkah. The Chesidosh Yom Tevim of Yutas Kislev, of Tes Yud Kislev, Rosh Chesidosh Kislev. Tevis, the beginning is still Hanukkah. Asar B'Tevis is a fast day, but Yehov Chiyom Emeil L'Sosun L'Simcha L'Meidim Tevim. It will, it carries the potential and will ultimately become a Yom Tev. Shvat as Tu B'Shvat. Other is Purim, Nisan is Pesach. Ir, the whole entire month. Every day we, we make a mitzvah, the mitzvah of Svirus Eimer. We have Pesach Sheni, Lag Eimer. Sivan, Shvuz. Tamu, Shivasa, but Tamu is like Asar, but Tevis, Yehov, Chiyam, Emelu. Lemoidim, Tevim. Of, you have Tishabav, which will also be transformed. And then you have Tubav, that the Mishnah says, that the Jews didn't have holidays. Lo Yehoi, Yom, Tevim, Yisrael, Ki, Compared to Yom Kippurim, holiday, Yom Tev. El, the entire month of El, is a Chedesh Harachimim that radiate the 13 divine attributes of compassion. Only Cheshvan does not have a holiday. Why such a stark contrast? Give one holiday. I mean, you could spread it out. And the answer is very clear from what we discussed. And I just want to read uh, one of the submissions that touches upon this. It says the following. It says... Why is Cheshvan called Mar Cheshvan? Which we'll get to in a moment, all in, the, in this context. Even though it has no holidays, the weather is not too freezing cold. The weather is not too freezing cold yet, as, as January and February are. But in all seriousness, Cheshvan shouldn't be looked down upon because of lack of holidays. It should be looked at as a more special month because we can still accomplish a lot of Teira and Mitzvahs, and we have to do it without the extra energy the holidays give us. So when we do mitzvahs and cheshvan, it is that much more special because it comes from us and not a special holiday energy that assists us. So instead of mar cheshvan, let's call it gili mashiach cheshvan. And absolutely correct because there's something that comes through asusa de latata, through the effort below, that's far more internalized, more premious, and it becomes part of us. We are talking before about inspiration, that it shouldn't just dissipate. As long as it's coming from above, that's Tishrei, that's great. It's a gift. But it's not yours. Cheshvan is now the real litmus test and the barometer. Have you really internalized it? If there was even one holiday in Cheshvan, you'd still have the gili from the holiday, the power of the holiday. Now we're given the opportunity. The giluim are there, but now we have to access it. And Odom Reitzim B'Kav Shaleh Yesu Metisha Kav Mishal Chavereh. explains the power of Aveide and Yegiyah. Your own effort, your own initiative, initiative. That a person desires one measure through their own effort more than nine measures as a gift. So $900 can buy a lot more than $100. $9,000 more than $1,000. But you'll also blow it quicker. It's not yours. So yes, in Giluim it has more power. But the one is yours. It's your baby. 
And that's what Cheshven is. So in that stark contrast, exactly, Tishrei, filled with holidays, saturated. And we have that power. Now, what are you going to do with it? You need to unpack it. You need to reveal it. You need to access it. And that's why Cheshven is called Mar Cheshven. Mar comes from the word bitter. Because when you think about it, initially it's very sad. Here you are celebrating in the palace of the king with all the revelations, and now you've got to go back to your regular routines and life. It's like a certain, uh, certain uh, it's a bit, bittersweet feeling about it. But then you're told, no, you can achieve a lot more through your effort with the power that you were given. And don't think that you don't have that power. The power is with you. But now you need to generate it. So it's not like God and Hashem stops giving us that energy. It continues. The head continues to control every day of the year. But now we need to reach and access it. During the holidays, we're lifted on its wings. It carries us. So it's a tremendous lesson in life as well. In general, the importance of inspiring someone, empowering them, but then making them feel, they need to be able to be a flame that rises on its own. And without Cheshven, we don't have the own rising on its own. You have that which was given to you. You're illuminated, warmed by higher forces. That's the power of the month of Cheshven, that Mar Cheshven. And that bitterness becomes actually transformed to something even sweeter, Mam Takim, as Alter Rebbe explains in Tanya, that when you turn something bitter into sweet, it's even st- sweeter than something that was initially sweet. Okay, so that covers the issue of the transition and the lessons learned and how important it is in general in our lives how to continue maintaining that vitality that's there. It's true on Rosh Hashanah, it's a new energy for the entire year, unprecedented energy. But the truth is every day, every moment, that energy is renewed. With unpacking the energy that was given to Rosh Hashanah, which is Er Chodesh, completely Er Chodesh. Not just Chidush HaYashemus, that's just renewing that which was there before. So we can access the Rosh Hashanah renewal in every day, in every moment's renewal, and really becomes, resolves the challenge of boredom and monotony and all that tainug, to me, the ain't a tainug, that, you know, a pleasure that continues, you suddenly, it loses its pleasurable novel element to it, that we can, but at this time it has to come from us and our efforts. Okay. Since we're talking about Bereshis, and yesterday was Shabbos Bereshis, and we didn't have a program last week, so I'll let me address some things from Shabbos, from Pasha Bereshis. Then we will talk about some things from Parshas Noyach, which is the coming Shabbos. Since we talked... Yeah. So question number one. The first three words of the Teda, the most famous words, are Breshiz Bara Lekim. The beginning God, in the beginning God created heaven. But the first three words... Why doesn't the Torah begin with Elikim Bara Bereshis? God created the beginning of existence. Instead, it implies the beginning created God. Or I wouldn't, I wouldn't say implies, it could be misunderstood that way. As if before existence there was no God, God forbid. This contradicts our belief that God always existed even before creation. Well, to strengthen the question, the says in the Gemara, Talmi Amel, the king, the Greek king, insisted that the Jews translate the Torah from Hebrew into Greek. But he knew that they may change things, and he wanted to have an accurate translation. So he took many sages and put them in different rooms so they couldn't communicate with each other, and then he can compare notes, he can compare their translations. They all changed, instead of writing in the beginning, beginning, Bereshis Bar Elikim, they translated that God created Bereshis, Elikim Bar Bereshis in Greek. So why doesn't the Torah just say it straightforward? Why does it even leave room for a different way of interpreting it. So most people translate, in the beginning God created heaven and earth. Is that what he's trying to say in the beginning? Or that God created the beginning? So first of all, this is not the only time where we find something in the Torah that can be misleading. There's something much more blatant in Parsha Bereshis. The Gemara says that when Moshe was, on, was learning, the Abish was giving him Torah, and he read, Nasa Adam, it came the sixth day of creation. Nasa Adam, it's Amenu Kid Musenu. We, us, Nasa, we shall create 
Bitsalmenu in our image and in our likeness. So Moshe immediately jumped on that. What does that mean, we? There's no plurality, there's no duality, God forbid. Our image? Your image, my image, God's image. And Hashem answers a very bizarre response. Those that want to make a mistake, let them make a mistake. But why allow that in the first place? There are many other ways that Hashem could have stated that statement. So you see, what does he mean by that? It wasn't just that God was setting it up and saying, okay, you know what, a cute uh, test that you can make a mistake. Existence itself is an agnostic world through the tzimtzum that God concealed his presence and allows us the choice to either recognize the truth or be, or be misled and by the darkness and feel, you know what? We don't foresee God. The truth is God is there, but he's concealed. His presence is concealed. So Hashem was saying, this is how I created the world. I want the world where you could make a mistake and don't make a mistake. See through the concealment and understand and appreciate that the world can on its own seem to imply a duality, but it's not the case. Similar to what it says in another place in the Gemara, when one of the philosophers asked Rabbi Akiva, God doesn't want idolatry. Why do you let him destroy the sun and the moon? So there won't be sun and moon worshippers. And Rabbi Akiva responded, because of some fools, God is going to destroy his own universe. He created a universe. People can be fools. They can choose to be fools. As the Tesis Yontav asks a follow-up question. Why didn't he ask the next question? So why didn't God destroy the fools? So he said, because you don't take away the free will. People can be foolish. Ezu Chachem, the wise one. He sees the birthing. Not just the future, the results. But he sees that, that the existence itself is being birthed and being renewed every moment by a creator. You have to apply yourself. So you can say that Bereshit is Baruch Kim fits in that. You want to interpret it the wrong way? You have that right, but that's not the goal. But that still doesn't fully answer the question why not say Elikim Baruch Bereshit. So one of the explanations is this Bereshis, you can translate in the beginning, you can create that, or that God created the beginning. God created time itself. And since the focus here is not on, so much on the God element, of course God created, but it's on the creation, so it says Bereshis, time, in the beginning, Bodo Lekim was created by God. With the focus being on the beginning of time. The Rebbe says, a fascinating footnote, he says that time and space we know is the very essence of existence. Modern physics, Einstein, and so on. Which one came first, time or space? And he says time came first. Because time is the concept of shinui, of shift. Past, present, and future in spiritual levels is about kadima v'ichr, that there's a shift. So before there's a creation of space, you need a shift and you need zman. As he explains it there. Bereshis is referring to the creation of time. Bora Lekim is created by God. Esa Shemayim Vesaris is the creation of space. So the focus here is saying the famous question, why didn't God create the world earlier? What, or what was there before creation? The answer is there was no before. Bereshis is Bora Lekim. Time itself was created. Now this is also, of course, implied when you say Lekim Bora Bereshis. But a fo- more focus on the time, on the creation of time, is when you start with Bereshis. Second point to make, and which is also a lesson for us, what is the Pasuk really telling us? The Pasuk is telling us that when you look at the world around you, you look at yourself, no, you're not self-made. Ain't over Nothing creates itself. You're a creation, Bereshis. You look at the world. You look at time. You look at space. Bar Alakim. God put this in place here. And always know that God runs the world. Rashi says on the Pasuk, what does he say? Why didn't the Torah begin with mitzvahs? It's a Torah that comes to teach us mitzvahs. Achedish HaZelachem is the first mitzvah. That's in Parsha Boy, the third chapter in Sefer Shmeis. Should, should have began with Achedish HaZelachem. The, the Kiddush HaLevona, Kiddush HaChedish. Sanctifying the new month, the new moon. Says Rashi, no, because the Ebershter wanted Koyach Mais of Higid La'ameh. That one day would come 
when the non-Jewish nations would say to the Jews, you're, you're thieves. You stole the Israel from us, the land of Israel. So God says, no, you have your answer. I created the earth. I created the land. And I gave, and first I gave the land was everyone's. But then I took a part of it and gave it to you just as I gave the rest of the world to the nations of the world. Koyach Maisev Higid explains Kabbal, the Emek HaMelech and Chassidus, that God is declaring, it's, not, it's true, it's also a practical answer to those that argue that we're thieves, but also on a more philosophical level, a spiritual level. The mundane world says, once God created us, we are in control. No. God is telling us, God is in control, and God decides. And the land itself is all part of God's creation. So the lesson is very clear to us. We look at a world which we can see sometimes make the mistake and think there's a duality or even think that God is not here and we come to realize no not only is God here but he gave us this land and he gave us your life he gave you your life and he blesses you and it's a constant process a constant renewal okay the next question in, say in, in Pastor Beresh is when were angels created we know there are angels Malachim we see later in the Torah it talks about Malachim you have the Malachim that came to Avram Avinu. You have the Malachim that came to uh, Yaakov and others. When were they created? You don't find them mentioned in the six days of creation. So the Medrash Rabbah discusses it and says there are two opinions. One is it was created in day two. The angels were created on day two when God created the firmament, the heaven. So he also created with heaven, he created the heavenly bodies as well as the heavenly angels. And, or a second opinion, day five. When it says that a bird will fly, it includes the angels. It refers to the angels. They don't fly physically, but conceptually is that they transcend. They are angels. They're angelic. They transcend earth and they soar on spiritual levels. That's the metric. The question is, what's, why, what's the argument here? I mean, is it the second day or the fifth day? But no, you can, you can explain that each one has a different element of what an angel is about. They're teaching us what that is. The angel, Malach, can also be translated as shliach, an ambassador, a messenger. Angels are divine messengers. Like the angels that came to Avram of you, they brought messages. Each one had its own message because the an angel is just one message. One brought healing to Avram of you, Malach Rafal. One brought the good news that they're going to have a child. And one brought and said, well, we will destroy Sodom. That was what that angel was sent to do. So an angel is a divine message, a divine package, if you wish, that's delivered to us. So there are two aspects to this angel, and that's why they're relevant to us, because they are teaching us, essentially carrying to us divine messages. So there's two elements to it. One is the divine element, which is what's created on day two, the heavenly component of the angel. Day five is more the focus, the transcendence of the angel, that, it's, that it soars, and therefore helps us soar, which is why we mention them, the Srofim, Eifani HaKedosh, the, Mal- the Chayis HaKedosh, and the Eifanim, the different types of angels. We mention them every day in Davening. Why? Because they inspire us to transcend our gravitational, the tug of the gravitational pull of material life. So then the focus is on their transcendence, if, 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 that, like a bird that flies. So you can say these are the two different opinions. Okay. Let's move to the next question. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, is a soul a creation? Or did souls always exist in the same manner that Hashem and the Torah always existed? Okay. Relevant to this parsha again, we find in the day six when man, the human being is created. What's the Pesach say? The verse says, Vayikach Hashem Alekim, God took Ofrim in Adom, earth from the ground. Vayipach Ba'apav Nishmas Chayim. He shaped it like with what would become a human being, but it's still not alive. It's just a golem. It's just a lifeless piece of clay or earth. So Vayipach Ba'ap of Nishmas Chaim, he breathed into it, he imbued it with Nishmas Chaim, a living soul. And that's why he called Odom Nefesh Chaya, 
the Am becomes a living entity. Neshama, therefore, is also pronounced Neshima, breath, because a soul is essentially God's breath. But this was day six. Was the soul created on day six? Or the human being, a soul and a body, was created on day six? So you look in the Midrashim, in the oral Torah, and you see Neshamas, Machshaftan Shal Yisrael, Kod Melechal Dover. The thought of the souls of Israel precede everything. Indeed, it even says in Medrash, that Shnei Dor and Kod Melechal two things preceded existence, Torah and Israel. The like Rashi brings in the first Rashi in Chumash, Bereshis, Bez Rashis. Two things precede everything. Rashis, Bishvil Yisrael, Bishvil Atera. The whole world is created for Yisrael and Tera. So in time, the creation of the soul and body came on the sixth day. But in intention, Seif Maisim Machshav Etchila, the end of the product began much earlier, conceptually. Not that there was any time before, like we said, time is a creation. But conceptually, think of it this way. You build a home. So first you build the bricks and the mortar and all the details. And then you move in there. But before you build the bricks and the mortar, you already had the intention, why am I building a home? So I should have a place to live, to dwell. Or my children. Or I'll sell it to someone. So an intention begins, the end is there in the beginning, is wedged in the beginning. Then comes the actual process. So Bapoil, in actuality, the soul was breathed into the body into the earth on the sixth day. But it essentially originates before. The Teda and the Shamas together work hand in hand. The Shamas are those ambassadors of the divine, much greater than angels. Angel, each one has their mission. With the Shama, they're carrying the entire, you could call it spiritual genetic code, and the DNA of what God wants to fulfill in this world. But they need a guide. They need a blueprint. So it says God looked into the blueprint and he created the terrorists. So too, we look in the blueprint and we sustain, created the world, I should say. God looked into the blueprint of the terror and created the world. And we too look into the blueprint to know how to elevate this world, to refine it and transform it into a garden, which also explains why the Garden of Eden is where Adam and Eve were placed. Even though it was a large world was created, because the whole point is to create a garden, a beautiful, divine ad- abode, and dwelling place for godliness, for holiness, for spirituality. So, in that sense, <clears throat> the souls exist, yes, on that higher level. Yisrael v'araisev kuchibrichu kula chad, says, they're all one. Obviously, there's only one God, but God imbued the Torah with his wisdom and his will. It's chachmasev v'rachen shal kodesh baruch hu, and the shom is alakush shanasa nivra, in the language of Chassidus, is the godly, the godly power and the godly mission that a soul is, is very fiber, carries that mission. And that, those two things combined. The Medrash says that since Torah and Israel and the Neshamas both precede existence, conceptually, which preceded which? But then I read, the Medrash continues, that it says, Tzav is B'nai Yisrael, Dabr el B'nai Yisrael, Command the Jews, command the souls, speak to them. That means the Torah was given in order for the Neshamas. That tells me that the Neshamas, the souls, precede even the Torah. So that's the general gist of it. Okay. Now, of course, the next step in the story is the fall. Fine. Now we have a Neshama, Adam, Adam, and then Zohar, Nekeva, Bores, a male and female. God then splits them, separates them and puts them into the Garden of Eden and says, eat from all the trees except Eitz Adas, Tevera. Do not eat from that tree. So let's continue questions on that part of the episode. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, after Adam and Chava ate from the tree of knowledge, why did they suddenly have the urge to cover up their private areas with giant fig leaves? What did they learn from the tree that made them embarrassed to be naked? So the Torah says exactly that, that they were naked and they weren't even conscious about it. Once they ate from the tree, they became conscious. And the answer is a very powerful answer because it also teaches you what is this Chet Eitzadas. It sounds when you read it without an explanation, what kind of tree is this anyway? And what, it means to, what does it mean to know good and evil? Before they didn't know good and evil, didn't God tell them, do this and don't do that? So they know there are things you're not supposed to do. But the word is Das, they became intimate with evil. 
Das is not just knowing something, not just being aware, cognizant, it's that you've experienced it. It's one thing if you know that something is forbidden. It's another when you taste from it. So your mind can tell you, what's the big thing? I know about it anyway. I might as well try it. Once you try it, it's a new reality. Before the eating of the tree of knowledge, they were seamlessly connected to their purpose. Just like they weren't aware necessarily of their nose and their eyes, they weren't aware of their own sexuality. A newborn child is not conscious because there's nothing wrong with sexuality. But as soon as you become aware and there's a subject and an object, self-consciousness was born on that sixth day when they ate from the tree of knowledge. Imagine a world without self-consciousness. And I don't mean self-consciousness as like awareness. I mean self-consciousness where yourself is conscious of yourself instead of a seamless flow of just fulfilling the purpose for which you were created. That's what happened. And therefore, they were embarrassed. They recognized suddenly, oh, you know, as long as I'm a newborn child psychologically, so I'm just an expression of what the God created me. Why would I be embarrassed about my private and intimate parts? But once they recognized that they are separate from that divine plan, now they felt embarrassed, which was a good sign, because it could have been worse. It could have been they, didn't even, they weren't even aware. But they were aware that they had, it was a, a dissonance. You could say also the creation of dissonance and self-consciousness. That's the main explanation. There are many different discussions on this topic. Um, so with that, I might as well go to the, another question that relates to this as well. And that is, why did God ask Adam, where are you? And here's how a person wrote this. Hi, Rabbi Jacobson. I'm a local apicotist that watches your Sunday podcast because I like that you answer all types of questions without censorship. My question is, in Parsha Bereshis, after Adam ate the fruit, or he says apple, apple is actually incorrect. The idea of Adam's apple is, a, is, not, is, a, is a, not based on Torah. There are four opinions, like he writes, perhaps if it was a fig, according to other opinions, it may have been a grape or even an, an esrig. And there's a fourth opinion that it was chita, grain. So he's according, so after Adam ate from this uh, forbidden fruit, Adam hides under a bush when he realizes God will be angry with him. And God says, hey Adam, where are you? Ayeka. Why did God have to ask that? If God is omni, omnis, omnis, omniscient, omnipresent, w- wouldn't he already know where Adam was hiding? Thank you and have a sweet and successful new year full of revealed blessings to you and all your viewers. So the Alter Rebbe was asked this question when he was in prison. So he gave Rashi's answer and the minister said, no, I want to hear your answer. So he stood up and looked at him in his eyes and said, this is an eternal question, a timeless question asked to each one of us. Asked to you, as to, uh, uh, the question is, you've lived so many, so many years of your life. He may have said 73, I'm not sure what the age was, but he was the exact age of this minister. You've lived all these lives. Where are you? What have you done with your life? I don't recognize you. Are you living up to your calling? Are you living up to the divine image in which you were created? He wasn't, God wasn't asking where you're hiding. He was saying, I don't recognize you. You've wandered away from your purpose. You've, you've essentially betrayed yourself and your mission and your calling. That's why we're told this question. Because that's what happened with Chetet Sadas. A type of dissonance in that sense. Okay. A few more questions on Bereshis, and then we'll move on to Nayach. Was it part of God's plan that Adam and Eve sin in order to repair? And if so, why shouldn't we sin for the same reason? So the person writes like this, according to the Zayar, as, at least as I understand it, it was a part of God's plan that Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit, so that humanity would have to repair the damage done by their sin. So if that's the case, that God secretly wanted them to sin so that repairs would have to be done to make the world stronger, then how do we know God perhaps secretly wants us to disobey the Sabbath day so repairs will have to be done to fix it and make it better? Well, a few points here. It does say, the concept of Neira Alila Bnei Odom, the Mitla Rebbe and Teres Chaim, and the Rebbe cites it a number of times, that God, in a sense, created a conspiracy. He set it up. 
put them in a garden, told them, here's a tree, do not touch, do not eat, tempted them, sent a serpent to tempt them even further. So it was like a setup. God like a, like a plot, like, to, like a trick to get people to... Um... But that's what existence is all about. As we said before, as I said before, the concealment of the divine tempts us, tests, tests us. It's exactly what God, what God did. He did not set up that they have to sin. Had they not eaten from the tree of knowledge, the story would be very different. There would still be a tree of knowledge. And there would be still different elements, but like, like the Zayar and Chassidus explains, very classic mimer in Tafresh Ayin Tess, Pasha Chukas, where it says, it says because of this sin they died. They would have lived forever had they not sinned. But we know in the Torah later it talks about Adam Kiyomus, about a person dying, people dying. Which means it's predestined. Since it's stuck, since a Paim Shana Kodma Torah Le'elem, we talked before. Tater precedes existence, and the Tater already has st- references to death. That seems to indicate that basically compelled Adam and Eve to eat. Because had they not, there would be no death. And the Zayar explains, and that Miami explains it in three different ways, that no, death would have had a very different meaning then. It wouldn't have been the pain, the death, the pain of death that we know. It would have been transition. It's a transition from one level to a greater level, so the lower level so-called dies. It's like shedding one layer of skin to, reach a, to, to assume a higher level of skin, a new level of skin, a new layer of skin. So in a world without the sin, it wouldn't have been painful to be, that's how you grow. In a world that once they ate from the tree of knowledge, now we also have the pain of that transition. So even though the soul lives on, there's a pain of that disconnect. So bottom line is this. It's a very subtle discussion because the the Rambam, and we know that a foundational element is free will. So you can't say that God takes away free will. However, he does create a world where we are challenged. In Gan Eden, I mean, I'm talking about Gan Eden in heaven, not the Gan Eden on earth. In the world to come, where the souls don't have bodies, there are no temptations. There's no Yetzirah, there's no challenge. Everything is divine. But God wanted a world where you can make a mistake, an agnostic universe with its symptom conceals the divine presence. And that requires setting a stage where you God, so you can say the concealment also sets us up. But the intention is not the concealment. The intention is for us to be wise. So the goal is not to sin and repair. The goal is to not be tempted by these challenges and transform the darkness into light. Now, if a person does sin, Obviously, there's the power of tshuva. But echtev ashev, we're told, if someone says, I'll sin in order to do tshuva, the tshuva is not accepted. Though the Alter Rebbe does say in Tanya twice, im dochak, if he really pushes, he can even transform that. Because because to sin and say, I'm going to do tshuva, means this, it means that the tshuva is not really a real tshuva, it's part of the sin. However, if you really push it, you can go to a place and transcend even that negative intention and actually heal. But that's another discussion. Okay. So let's move now to Parsha Noyach. Lessons from Noyach. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, on what grounds did Hashem have the right to destroy the generation of Noyach with a flood? Technically, the people weren't doing anything wrong if the Torah wasn't given yet to instruct people with the rules of right and wrong. And the seven laws of Bnei Noyach, Noah laws, came afterward. They were given to the offspring of Noyach, Hence, they are called Bnei Neach. So did Hashem commit a crime against humanity? So a few things need to be clarified. First of all, the Sheva Mitzvahs Bnei Neach are called Bnei Neach because there was one Mitzvah that was added afterwards, but they were actually given to Oda Mechava, to the human race, before Neach. The reason they're called Bnei Neach, the Reb Marash actually has a gloss where he says, Tzorachim, we have to understand why they're called. But technically, the reason is because Adam and Chav only had six mitzvahs. They were not allowed to eat meat. So once they were given permission to eat meat, the Ebershtim, there's another seventh mitzvah called Eber Menachai, they're not to eat uh, from a, living, a, limb, a limb from a living animal. That was not relevant before because they were not allowed to eat animals altogether. So the Marash asked, so why are all the mitzvahs called Bnei Neach? So there's different ways you can perhaps explain it because then, in a way, it was like they re after the flood, they, re, they recommitted to these laws. 
So number one, the human race had laws, and they desecrated them, they defiled, they transgressed. It was a world filled with crime and corruption, and, uh, and therefore, so that's number one. To say they got this, these commandments before, later is not correct. They did that them, so they knew quite well. The second thing is this. God created the world. He can choose what he wants. It's not like to ask a question, does he have a right to destroy? Did he have a right to create? And you look at the end of Bereshis, he says, I created it, but then I regret recreating it. Now, this is a big discussion. What does it mean he regretted? God didn't know that humans can sin and will sin. But the regret means that there's two states, Rashi says, there's a time where God enjoys the world because he created it for a purpose. And there's a time where he sees the, the pain and he acknowledges the pain and there needed, in the words of Chassidus, a cleansing. The mabal was a cleansing. 40 days and 40 nights, like uh, the 40 cubits of a mikveh, the mayim rabim, the, the mabal, was a cleanser. Now, why did God create it that way? So there's different sikhs from the Rebbe, Chelik Tezvav, the Kutte Sikhs, volume 15, there's a beautiful sikh. Because God first created the universe as a gift. He wanted people to earn their way. But because when you give a gift to children, they can blow it. And they did. So in a sense, the mabal was a part of the maturity process, cleansing the world. And that's where their lifespan went down so dramatically. Because the lifespan that they had, almost a thousand years, was a gift from above. Chazesh al Baruch and Zunan. Once they so-called, they so-called took for granted and abused that gift, now, no, now you're going to live 120 years, but it's going to be through your effort. And indeed, the Torah was not given until 26 generations after creation. Why? If the whole purpose is Torah. Because like education, first you educate a child before you give them the obligation. So essentially, before Matan Torah, essentially the world was like conceptually like children that are being educated what God wants, but they don't yet have the obligation. By Matan Torah, they receive the obligation. Now, Avram, Yitzhak, Yankov, and those generations, they reversed the process that was corrupted by the first generations. So that's the picture of how this works. And therefore, they were absolutely obligated and responsible and accountable for their behavior, and that's where the Mabel came. According to the Torah, Noach and his family spent an entire year on the ark. What did they do aboard the ark not to go crazy with cabin fever? Was there entertainment on the ark? Was there a diving board so they could jump into the flood and do some swimming for exercise? Maybe some shuffleboard courts on the upper deck were they allowed to read books to help pass the time? Well, being that they were quality people, so they definitely used the time to study to meditate, and to look at what our grave responsibility is. Look, our world is being destroyed because it could not tame itself and could not contain itself. So I'm sure that the people of that caliber, with a noyach among them, were speaking about this and studying about it and praying. The Midrashim speak about some of the activities they were involved in, but clearly that was part of it. And especially the sensitivity. You see a world being destroyed around you you're not, just, you're not just oblivious like a tzaddik in Pelts that says, hey, Aeneas Nafshid Salti, I saved my own life. I don't really care about anyone else. So they were involved in a deep introspection and deep meditations and commitments for the day when they would leave this ark and begin to rebuild the world. Okay. Hello, Rabbi. Kangaroos are native to Australia. Never have fossils of kangaroos been found anywhere in the world other than in Australia. If Noah took two of every animal in his ark, how did he find kangaroos in the, middle of, in the Middle East where he launched his ark from? And after the flood, how did the kangaroos get back from Mount Ararat in Turkey to Australia, which is an island, without leaving any fossils anywhere along the route? Along the route. Perhaps Noah's flood was not a worldwide flood, but a regional flood, and 4,000 years ago, the inhabitants of Mesopotamia and the Levant believed they were the only civilization, so when they recorded the events of the flood, they recorded it as a worldwide flood. Well, a few points here. There clearly had to be some miracles 
to get all those creatures onto the ark. And it could very well be because God wanted to preserve all the species. He also got the kangaroos there. And it may have been a miracle to get them there. That's number one. So number two, maybe kangaroos evolved from creatures after the flood. Maybe they weren't existent before the flood. That's also a possibility. I've never seen it written about, but I'm just throwing out different thoughts and ideas on the topic. The point is, like somebody writes in the follow-up question here, if the purpose of bringing animals into Noah's Ark was to prevent extinctions, in other words, the God wanted to preserve two so they can continue to perpetuate their species, so why is it then that God would allow and not prevent thousands of animals, a- animals from becoming extinct in the years after the flood, until, the current, until our current time? Okay, interesting question. So there's no it's God wanted to save the world. He didn't want to destroy it all. So, he, of course, he saved the human race through Noach and his family. He saved animals by having two of each kind, so that way it have to be created anew. Even though God could have done that, but he wanted it to be as much as possible a continuation. He didn't want to destroy it all and start from scratch, which makes sense because there's a purpose for existence. The problem is they defiled it. They polluted it. They corrupted it. Okay. So in that, in that sense, you could ask if that's the case, so why, is there, why are there extinctions of species? So first of all, let's start with the, from the bottom up. Many of the extinctions are due to man, not because they just got extinct. Human negligence and human behavior that has destroyed certain species. And here again, God gave free will. We can build and improve the world. We can also destroy it. So that's where Bechira, free will, comes in. We could, we could do damage. Secondly, you could, you could argue that this whole point, um, of extinction, there's, God wanted certain basic species to be there, but that doesn't mean that certain species could die out. It's not like, this doesn't stay just because there were two animals from, from each species, that, this, that there can be no extinction of animals. For different reasons, things may go extinct. I'm talking about besides human behavior. There's no contradiction to that. I'm not sure why that would be a contradiction. Okay. How was, next question, how was waste disposed of on the ark? Did Noah just stand on the edge of the deck and do his business directly into the ocean? But that doesn't answer the question because you have other people and also many, many animals. That might be easy for humans to do, but how is it possible for eight people to take care of tens of thousands of animals and not have diseases break out from all the animal waste? Okay. So the Gemara and Sanhedrin, cited by Rashi in a different order in, in uh, Noyach, talks about that there were three floors. The, Gemara, the Pasuk says there were three floors in the ark. The lower floor, middle floor, and the top floor. And says the top floor was for the humans, the people. The middle floor was a mother, was a, was a place where the animals were kept. And the lowest floor was for waste. It says it clearly, for waste. In some places, some suggest there may have been a trap door that took the waste out to the, ocean, to the waters. But that's not in, the, in, in, in most of the commentaries. So that's number one, the waste. But number two, which is more important, what's the lesson to us of these three levels? So in Chassidus, Tzemach Tzedek talks about it in Eir Atere, the Rebbe cites it in Amayim Lech Lecha Tov Shalamet Ches, citing from the Kutte Deburim, from a Sikha from the Friedrich Rebbe. And we say, Tachtenim Shni Meshlishi, meaning the lowest level, the middle and the third, is referring to three levels of the soul. And when a soul gets an aliyah, it's an aliyah in all these levels. Remember, the ark represents letters of the words of Teira and Tefillah, Teva, that when we are submerged in the f- flooding rage waters of materialism and of Daigas Parnasa concern about love, livelihood and all the nonsense of this world, it can deluge us, de- deluge and create and overwhelm us. So Hashem says, build an ark. An ark is the letters, the holy letters of Teira and Tefillah, of, st- of Torah, study and prayer 
they will serve as an, a buffer, an oasis that will immunize, that will insulate you from those flooding rage waters. So, but the soul has several levels, as we say every morning. The soul you've given me is pure. You created it, you formed it, you imbued it within me, and you protect it within me. Protection, like an ark. So we're told that the ark was lifted up by the waters. It not only protected from the waters, the very waters lifted the ark and created an aliyah in all levels of the soul. So there are two ways it's explained. The lower level is sometimes explained as nefesh, and the next level, ruach and neshama. We know the soul has five dimensions, nefesh, ruach, neshama, chay, yechideh, but sometimes the first lowest level is naran, nefesh, ruach, neshama, the conscious part of the soul. The middle is chaya, and the third level is yechideh. So sometimes it's bri, yetzir, asiya, the three worlds. Sometimes it's biya, is the lowest level, and atzilis is the next level, and then ak, the highest level. Which means, basically, that the ark represents the soul as it travels through this, the flooding rage waters of this world. So first of all, you have that protection. Second of all, you're even elevated. Once you have that protection, you're elevated by the very, rage, by the very flood waters. And that elevation affects all of us. The lowest level of the neshama, of course, is the place where there's waste. Because it's dealing with mundane matters. That's the lower level. The next level is dealing with the animal soul. And the third highest level is the divine soul. So you see how the levels, even of the ark, also are relevant to our personal service and of God and relationship with God. Okay. One more Noyach question. It says, Ein simcha ele babasar. That joy can only be done through, through meeting meat. So, why did Nayar, so what did Nayar do in order to attempt to have joy before being given permission by Hashem to eat flesh? As I mentioned before, Adam and Chava were told not to touch, not to eat any flesh. They were vegetarians, essentially. Nayar, after the flood, was given permission. So what's the reasoning? Because as I said earlier, before the flood, they were far more refined. Not refined through their effort. God created them more refined. So stay away from meat, which is a harder food to elevate its sparks. But after the mabul, now comes the work from the bottom up, like we talked about cheshvan. Your efforts, not just what you're given as a gift. So now you have to also deal with the, also this element of meat, which is a harder, bitter, more difficult thing to refine, but it has higher sparks. That's how Chassidus explains this issue. Okay. There's a few follow-ups that I'd like to do. I mean, I don't know if I can do them all, many about the holidays. Sukkot, Simchas Torah, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, I even go back to chapter Vayelach. I think, uh, I don't know if I can go back all the way, but I'll just do a few with Simchas Torah and maybe Sukkot. And then we shall uh, do the Chassidus question. So here's the question about, about uh, Simchas Torah. And Sukkot, okay. Let's start with Sukkot. Let's start with Sukkot. So a person is referring to something I discussed two weeks ago. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, in your pre sukkahs broadcast, another, listens, another listener cites a medrash about the nations who refused the Torah because they did not want to sit in the sukkah because it was uncomfortably hot. It's not exactly what the Talmud says, but okay. He then speculates that Jews who complain that it's too hot to sit in the sukkah may be descendants of gerim, of converts. I'm a giyaret, a convert, who has been blessed with a wonderful Jewish husband and delightful and upright Jewish children and grandchildren. Ken yirbu. May they multiply. And I was glad to hear you dismiss his speculation. After all, my children who love the mitzvah of sukkah and who grew up with happy memories of building and living in our own sukkah come from ancestors who said yes. Okay, so that's a statement. Thank you for that. Another person writes, the Jewish calendar and holidays are Israel-centric. We spoke about that it's the the hot season. It's difficult to sit in a sukkah, and that was how God tested the Gentiles, the Gentile nations. So someone writes, Hi, Rabbi J. The Jewish calendar and holidays are Israel-centric. Pesach is the spring holiday, even though it's fall in Australia. 
Sukkot is, is at a time in Israel when the weather is perfect, not the summer heat yet prior to the rainy season. The fact that it's cold and raining or snowing in other parts of the world doesn't mean that we should create tatus and why the sukkah isn't in a different season. Well, what creating tatus is coming from reliable sources, and they say that clearly. So one of the reasons we sukkah is not right after Pesach, we discussed this a few weeks ago, because then people would say, you know, you're sitting in the sukkah at convenience because it's the beginning of the spring. Clearly, even in Israel, or at least in that region, the autumn was not quite the same. The beginning of the rain season, maybe still the heat of the summer, maybe not the full intensity, but there's something there that clearly makes it a little more difficult. So even though it's called a mitzvah kala, easy mitzvah, but because of the heat, they couldn't sit there. And we're definitely talking about, about, about that region, or you can say, actually, we're not. We're talking about the nations of the world, the nations of the entire world. Rome, the children of Yishmael, so you could argue that in those places where they were given a sukkah, it was far more uncomfortable than it would have been in Israel itself. Okay. Loshen hara bar Hashem and sukkahs. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, due to thousands of years of Golas, our people have, our people has endured. We have developed a bad habit, a bad habit about talking loshen hara about Hashem's scheduling of the sukkah's holiday. As someone who lives in Israel, I can assure you that it is the perfect time of year to dwell outdoors. Is before the rainy season, but after the heat of summer. All these drushas often quoted, often quoted by those who live in chutzlaretz, outside of Israel, about bad weather and sukkahs only has to do with chutzlaretz. Because of our sins, we were exiled from our land. Maybe soon merit the gula amitiz vashlema. Okay, I hear what you're saying. Um, well, the fact of the matter is that sukkahs is celebrated not just in Eretz Yisrael, but if an Eretz Yisrael is very comfortable, God bless you, and that's great. Um, but there, there could also be all kinds of situations. I am sure that it could get very hot in Israel, even in, in September. So maybe that's what some people refer to. Talk another point about simcha by eating meat. Hello, Rabbi Jacobson. My question is, if it says, Ein simcha ele babasar, that simcha is only possible through meat, and in other places it says simcha peres together, that simcha breaks through all boundaries, doesn't mean we can burst through the boundaries of Golas and bring Mashiach by eating meat. <laughs> I wouldn't quite put it that way. We can break through anything with joy. One of the things we're told, meat, by Yom Tov, to eat shami simcha, to eat meat, because meat makes the, makes the simcha greater just like wine does. It says also in simcha lebiyayin. But it doesn't go that you first eat meat. It's about a simcha shal mitzvah. It's a simcha that God wants, that breaks through boundaries. And when necessary, when the Torah tells us, you eat the meat, whether it's on Shabbos or on Yontem. Can you explain the origin and source that the Ushpizim visit our sukkah and what the significance is? Also, in our community, we have a custom that our former Rebbe's also Ushpiz our sukkahs. Correct, the Chesidah show Ushpizim. The Friedrich Rebbe is not on the list. Is there a reason the Mitla Rebbe and the Rashab have days on Sukkot, and they visit, but the Friedrich Rebbe doesn't visit during Sukkot. Thank you, and have a happy Sukkot. Well, first of all, the source and origin is in Zayar, a number of places, where it says clearly that the Ushpizen come, the seven Ushpizen, and counts them, Avram, Yitzhak, Yanker, Moshe, Aaron, Yosef, and Shlema, and there's another opinion, David, and, and Yosef, and David, and why that order, and that every day there's a, there's a primary Ushpiz guest, and the others come with him and they say a particular verse. Obviously, we're talking about spiritual energy of these Ushpizen, of these guests. The Friedrich Rebbe revealed that there's also Chesidish Ushpizen, the Baal Shem Tov, the Magid, the, corresponding to the first seven days. The Baal Shem Tov and the Magid, the Alter Rebbe, the Mitla Rebbe, the Tzedek, the Rebbe Marash, and the Rebbe Rashab. So you cover the seven days that correspond to Avram through uh, Moshe, or Avram through Yosef, however you count, or Shleiman. Seven. Seven was business, what the Zayar says. But it says, in, the Rebbe says, but we go further. Shmini Atzeres is connected, Yosef of our generation, which is the Friedrich Rebbe. Yisod. So the first go till Yisod, Netzachayid. Yisod. And we, of course, would say the next day, Simchas Teira, is the day of the Rebbe. So it's the ninth that the Rebbe is the day of Simchas Teira. But this is more. 
what it says befeidish, and this is more what the hergeshim of chesidim is. So the Friedrich Rebbe, Ashpinet says, we do eat in a sukkah, we just don't eat with a bracha. And we say goodbye to the sukkah. So the Friedrich Rebbe has still a connection to that, as the Rebbe explains in his talks on this uh, topic. Okay. I think I covered, I was going to do some chesteda, but this, the time is limited. So we're going to now, I'll do the chesidus question, and then we shall conclude. The chesidus question goes like this. Please explain the application of the Chetet Sadas to our personal lives. Yes, that's a very, one of the most famous stories. We talked about it before. But just continuing from where I left off. Chetet Sadas, like all Torah, are events that happen in history. But these events are also, spiritually, they happen all the time. So Avram and his Chesed is living right now. The Chesed that we do is Avram, embodied through Chesed, personifying kindness. And Pachet Yitzchak is Gvura. And Avram is the, and Yaakov is the Abida of compassion, of Teferis and beauty. Moshe is another level. Aaron is another level. So all the stories and narratives and characters and events in the Torah are all spiritual. They're all spiritual events that happen at a particular time in history. Chetet Sadas is the same thing. We all have a microcosmic Chetet Sadas or Eitz Sadas. We born children. Innocent, seamless, not self-conscious about our own, even about our own sexuality, innocent, and then there will be the day we we we, but we will be challenged. And chetet sadas is the loss of innocence. You taste something, you do something that you shouldn't have done, and that creates a breach, a schism, between who you are and what you do, between your soul's divine mission and your actions and your behavior. That dissonance is post Chetzat Sadas experience. And then the goal is, is to reconnect. Just like Yom Kippur teaches us, that even though there was a breach, there was a betrayal, the tablets were broken, we can rebuild. So in our personal lives, there's the pre Sadas would be that innocence. Sadas, Chetzat Sadas would be the loss of innocence. And then the rest is history, which is the work we do to redeem, to reconnect, and rebuild and repair the broken shards, the shattered containers. That's the brief answer. So it really is an eloquent story, though there's pain involved and setbacks, but it's the story of life where we begin innocence, innocence is lost, but you can regain and reclaim it in even greater ways. And with that, let's conclude as we go from Shabbos Bereshis into Noyach, that we go from Tishrei into Cheshvan, that we carry this powerful energy and don't be deceived by the darkness, by the lack of holidays and the concealment in Cheshvan. It's only telling us that now is your turn to unpack that which you gathered and collected in your arsenal during the month of Tishrei. Everyone should have a good Geben Shtiar, a good Chedish Cheshvan, transforming Cheshvan to the month of when the Beis Amidrash was built and we're here every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. My Life Chassidus Supply. This has been episode 373. Be well. This program is brought to you by My Life Chassidus Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at chassidusapplied.com donate.